Good afternoon and welcome to our uh, spring 2023 um, data protection update webinar. In it, so as usual format, um, I'm going to be presenting um, alongside my colleagues uh, Grant Campbell and uh, Rachel Lawson within our data protection and information team. Um, and today as ever we've got a fairly packed programme. Um, we will kick off with an update on where we are in data protection reform in the UK. Uh, so Grant will do that. Um, I'm then going to talk a bit about AI, generative AI and chat GPT and what all that means um, when thinking about it from a data protection perspective. Then going to hand on to Rachel who's going to talk about online services and children and what we can learn from the fine that was issued to TikTok earlier this year. And then back to Grant who's going to talk about international data transfers and looking not just at what is happening in terms of the UK but also looking further afield uh, in terms of what's going on in other jurisdictions and how that might impact on you if you uh, your business has entities overseas or you're receiving data from, from other parts of the, the world. And then we'll finish off, um, if we have time, just with a, a quick uh, case digest and some horizon scanning of what's coming up next uh, and some questions. So on that, I, I will hand over to Grant, who's going to kick off on uh, data reform. Thank you, Martin. So um, here's a timeline of events from the end of the Brexit period. So. Um, I think we covered this previously, but it's worth a recap. So at the end of December, the end of the post-Brexit transition period, we have UK GDPR. Then in September 2021, the government published a consultative paper about taking uh, UK data protection law in a new direction. And then the government published its response to the consultation, which I think was a little bit mixed, but then that resulted in the government, so the Boris Johnson administration, publishing his Data Protection and Inform Digital Information Bill Number 1, which was introduced to Parliament in July 2022. And at second reading stage in September, the bill got paused and was not re reintroduced back into Parliament. Then uh, Michelle Donnellan introduced a new, uh, announced a new change in approach in October of 2022, and that's resulted in a new bill which I'll call the number two bill. Um, so it's the same name as the first one, but it's the number two bill, which uh, was published in March. So this is, this. I think it's just, just relevant in terms of the, the context. So this was Michelle Donnellan, and this is what she said at the Tory party conference in October. She announced that we will be replacing GDPR with their own business and consumer friendly British data protection system. Our plan will be to protect consumer privacy and keep data safe or retaining adequacy so that business can trade freely. And I can promise that it will be simpler and clearer for business to navigate. So that was the political rhetoric. And what was introduced on 8th of March is 214 pages long. It has 114 clauses and 13 schedules, and it operates by amending the current legislation, the DPA 2018 and UK GDPR by a series of insertions and deletions. And the reality is that despite the spin, it isn't actually that much different to the number one bill that was introduced beforehand. Uh, it's a complicated set of laws. There is no consolidation, but, and we've included a link here, uh, keeling schedules have been published and those keeling schedules do help make sense of what is actually proposed. If you look at the number two bill itself, it is very, very difficult to navigate your way through. So um, the bill obviously may be subject to change through Parliament. So I just wanted to pick up on some selected changes that the bill would introduce. There are a lot more, but I'm trying to pick the ones that I think are probably of most general application. Um, in personal data, there is greater clarity clarity on identifiability and a statutory basis for determining whether when a person is going to be identifiable by reasonable means. And I think that is to be welcomed. On legitimate interests, uh, there is the proposed introduction of recognised legitimate interests. So these are going to be included in an annex at the back. And they're mainly public purposes, uh, but where they apply there is no legitimate interest balancing test. So they are presumed to be there and you don't need to apply the balancing test. And there's clarification. So you, those of you who deal with GDPR and particularly the EU GDPR, there are various recital references that are quite helpful in, in interpreting the 
GDPR. So what the UK government's tried to do in this bill is take some of those and actually give them formal statutory basis. So legitimate interest can include direct marketing, and also in, uh, there's a legitimate interest in intergroup transfers for internal administration purposes and for ensuring the security of network and information systems. And the government's saying this will give greater clarity to people that they can actually rely on legitimate interest for these things. On data subject requests, there are greater safeguards for controllers against what are now vexatious or excessive requests and some uh, guidelines as to what will be vexatious or excessive. And if you uh, fall into that camp, then you can either charge a reasonable fee to respond to those requests, or you can refuse to act on them. The government's also uh, taken what was good practice guidance and given a statutory basis to the periods of pause where you're waiting for the requestor to provide further information to identify the information or the processing activities to which the request relates. So the time period will definitely stop. On automated decision making, so the, the kind of general prohibition that was in the EU and UK GDPR as it stands for uh, against automated decision making on any kind of data has been removed, now only applies, uh, it only now applies to special category data, but it is subject to new safeguards. And I think government is hoping that that will open up the possibility of greater use of legitimate interests and potentially may be helpful in terms of uh, things like AI. On accountability, uh, the approach is less prescriptive. So there are a number of measures in the bill. So uh, throughout the current GDPR, there's references to taking uh, technical and uh, uh, operational measures in various contexts, the, the legislation will now say take appropriate measures, including technical and op operational measures. So it's maybe a bit more nuanced, a bit more risk based, but it's not really clear that it actually makes much of a change to what the legislation currently requires. Uh, the requirement for non UK controllers and processors to appoint representatives in the UK will be removed. The role of the DPO is going to be replaced by a senior responsible individual. Uh, and you have different roles for SRIs for controllers and processors, but the risk is on high risk, the focus is on high risk processing. And the role can be operated by someone in senior management. And I think that potentially leaves it open that there may be less independence and more scope for running into conflicts for SRIs between their senior management role and the role that they've got under the legislation. Record keeping, much, much more focus now on processing that is likely to be high risk. So the Article 30 registers that we know, the ROPAs uh, currently, they are going to disappear. Um, DPIAs are being replaced by assessments of high risk processing. Uh, one significant change is that even if you go through the assessment of high risk processing and conclude that the processing is high risk, you may consult with the ICO, but consultation is no longer mandatory. And the ICO will be tasked under the legislation with producing examples of what it considers to be high risk processing. Uh, soft opt-in for um, charitable, political and, and non-commercial organisations. The anomaly that only commercial organisations could rely on soft opt-in soft opt has been removed. And on cookies, um, a softening of the regime, I think it's a slow move to, to opt out. So um, more, uh, more uh, purposes for, for cookies uh, are being moved from consent to opt out. And there are expansions of categories of use that are deemed to be necessary. On the international transfers front, and I'll talk a little bit about um, what's happening on a, on a wider basis, but in terms of reform, so the Article 45 adequacy decision concept is going to be removed. So rather than have an adequacy decisions under the UK GDPR, we're going to have uh, regulations issued by the Secretary of State. On Article 46 mechanisms, and this I think is significant, so this is where you're using UK data transfer agreements, addenda, BCRs, uh, they can only be used with the controller or processor. And the legislation or the draft bill says acting reasonably and proportionately 
considers that the data protection test is met. So there's an element of discretion now for controllers or processors in considering whether the, the safeguards are adequate. And the data protection test, so you'll recall that under UK and EU GDPR as it stands at the moment, the standard is essentially essential equivalence. So the new data protection test, and it's on the slide, is met in relation to a transfer of personal data if after the transfer, the standard of protection provided for the data subject with regard to that date, with regard to that personal data would not be materially lower than the standard of protection afforded under UK data protection law. So that is a, that is a different test, a subtly different test. And I think the government expects that that will be easier for controllers and processors to meet than the essential equivalent test under the EU legislation. Um, in terms of the, the overview of GDPR in the UK, I think the other thing that I would just highlight, and I think Rachel's going to talk a little bit about this in the context of ICO fines and, and activities and enforcement, I think the, the role of the ICO is, it's, I think their view of the world is slightly diverging from perhaps European regulators. And I, I'm not gonna take go through the slide in great depth, but I think it's noticeable that when the ICO released its um, three year plan in 2022, the ICO 25 plan, you know, one of the main, um, one of the main uh, objectives is to empower responsible innovation and sustainable economic growth. And I think that's the sort of language that you wouldn't associate with the European Data Protection Board and it's much narrower remit. So I think we can see perhaps in terms of not just the statutory divergence through the number two bill if it becomes enacted, but also we can begin to see the beginnings of some regulatory divergence in terms of the wider remit that the ICO perhaps has, which probably ties into the post-Brexit view of the world in terms of Britain looking outwards and trying to encourage commercial and economic activity more widely. So I think that kind of indicates perhaps just a change in emphasis and a change in view in terms of the, the regulatory drivers behind the legislation as well. Thank you. Thanks, Grant. Uh, so I'm going to talk for the next few minutes um, about artificial intelligence and particularly around chat GPT, GPT-4 um, and generative AI, which is um, a topic I think that uh, we're getting lots of, of questions on. So th th this section, uh, before I kind of go into it, uh, today really is talking about the data protection aspects of this. We could run a whole, a whole webinar on its own on the legal issues in relation to using generative AI. Um, but today we're just going to focus on the data protection parts of it. But before we get into that, it's maybe just worth for those of you that are not familiar with the technology or don't really know much about how it works, just kind of think about a scene setting. So ChatGPT and GPT-4, the, the two products that you have heard a lot about, um, are uh, run by, offered by a company called OpenAI. They're what are called large language models. So they they learn, um, they have algorithmic you know, approach and they, they learn from huge amounts of data. So with ChatGPT-4, it was let loose on the internet to just basically um, scour everything. I imagine it's a bit like, you know, Johnny Five in Short Circuit, where we just read books in a, in a second. And um, for those of you that remember your, your 80s films, um, just scouring loads and loads of stuff and then actually building that up, that knowledge. And ChatGPT and GPT-4 are, are more about sort of text-based tools, but OpenAI also does DALI, which um, produces images. And again, you may have seen some of these AI-generated um, images, which uh, we're seeing lots of, such as the, um, you know, uh, I think it was the one with the Pope wearing a, a puffer jacket and stuff um, a couple of months ago. So they, they learned from a huge amount of training material. And the, the, the point to bear in mind is that while a lot of that stuff is set in the public domain, if you're using these tools, then that can include your input as well. So things that you upload to it to um, ask your, your questions when you're when you're reading your prompts. And then the way that it works um, is that the output is based on predictions. So it's literally answering that question, what does the algorithm think is likely to be the next word in that the output for that thing? What's the most likely word that comes next? And sometimes it's wrong. Or quite often it's right. And quite often some of these producers are really good or the, the output's good. But quite often, you know, they can just literally make things up. And I'll, I'll give an example of that on on the um the next slide. So 
you just need a bit of caution in terms of what what you're doing with that. And it's interesting speaking to um, you know uh, technical experts in this in terms of this whole new concept of prompt engineering, which is the science around how you actually use generative AI and how you actually use the prompts, the questions that you ask it to get the output you want. And there's a real science in terms of actually how you do that and generating um, more accurate responses in, in terms of how you construct your questions. Um, with ChatGPT, you can use it in two ways. You can use a web interface, but you can also use an API where you connect it or, or embed it into your own technology. And I'll talk a bit about why that's important um, in a couple of slides time. But you, know, you can see with this, there are a number of areas of potential risk. So what happens to your input data? If you're up in, uploading something that's got potentially personal data into it, what happens to it? Um, where does it go? How reliable is the output data? So if you're potentially using it to generate um, output, which might relate to individuals, how accurate is that? Um, and how do you manage your data protection obligations? So particularly I'm thinking around the key principles in relation to accountability and transparency um, within uh, data protection law. Um, but there's also a whole lot of other things in terms of security, um, you know, data protection by design and default and all of these things. And that is in addition to all the other legal risks that I mentioned, such as IP, um, you know, licensing, use of content you provide, the output, liability and accuracy of content, potential defamation, all sorts of other things. So there's there's lots of things to be thinking about on that. Um, we can go to the next slide. So I, I said I had a bit of fun with it. So I asked it to write a biography for me um, when I was preparing for this. Um, I'm not going to share the whole thing because it was a bit too gushing um, in terms of how, how I wrote it. But I picked out this paragraph because it says here that apparently I'm a member of the International Association of Privacy Professionals. Now, lots of data protection lawyers are. I'm not a member. But it clearly has thought, well, Martin is a, uh, someone who does a lot of data protection work, um, and therefore it's likely that that might be in the biography. But that's that's totally made up, you know, so that's not not true. And just an example of, I don't know where that came from, it's certainly not from reading my Brody's biography or biographies of me for um, attending conferences or speaking at events. It's that's come from it looking at other people who do similar things and then coming up with a prediction as to what might be in there. So a good example, I think, of just where you get the you know the, the fake news to to, to use a, um, a an often used phrase. Okay, so you may have heard a bit about um, Italy and ChatGPT being banned there. So what happened there? Well, this this was the Italian Data Protection Authority issuing an order that temporarily suspended ChatGPT, and this wasn't about use by Italian businesses per se, but more about actually the data that OpenAI was collecting and holding and then using for training purposes and the risk on, in, on individuals. So Italian DP had a number of concerns. One of them was in relation to a lack of certain clarity on the legal basis that OpenAI was relying upon for retaining data for training purposes. It didn't properly explain that. It didn't have a very clear retention period. Um, it, uh, there were issues around transparency, around how, how data was used and individuals' rights and also how individuals actually exercise their rights under data protection law as well. You know, how would you ever actually get data deleted because they said once you upload it, it can't be. So we had um, a bit of progress in that at the end of end of April and ChatGPT is now available for use in Italy. Um, but it's interesting to see some of the changes that have come in. So, for example, um, there's now new age verification checks. There's um, you require consent of the users on the age of 18. There's a more detailed privacy notice um, explaining what OpenAI does with data um, that, it, that it collects um, and clarification around the legal basis that applies um, to retention of data for training purposes. So they, they talk about they're doing that based on legitimate interests and also explaining a bit more about how individuals exercise their rights. So it's interesting to see, you know, one, one of the EU regulators taking some fairly um, draconian action there in terms of issuing an order to spend use of it and actually within a month or so actually seeing some substantive changes and i think it just shows you know that open air is having to respond to to different regulators around the world and and develop these systems as they become more and more more prevalent what does open ai say about using personal data in chat gpt well i mentioned before this difference between the web interface and the ai the api so with a web interface um open ai's terms actually say you shouldn't be using this for personal data or confidential information we're not giving any guarantees it's kept secure um, but also the default is that if you're using the web interface and everything you upload is retained for training purposes, um, unless you go and actually take steps to opt out of that. Uh, compare that with the API. So if you use the API, the default is the information you, that is uploaded in your prompts um, or uh, in, in your questions 
is not retained. So that's a really important difference to understand if you're thinking about using it within your organization and you're thinking about use cases that might, for example, involve um, personal data or other sensitive information. We do have a data processing addendum. It is a pretty standard SaaS service provider uh, DPA, um, but you need to ask for that. It's not automatically part of the contract. You need to fill in a form and then add it on. And it always assumes that OpenAI acts as a processor. And I'm, uh, you know, I question whether in all use cases that's correct. We've looked at some of the clients around how they're considering using it and actually query whether that always will, will always be right or whether actually, you know, it should it, it, OpenAI actually be, be the controller or a joint controller. You need to be aware that OpenAI is based in, in USA, so you need to do a chapter five um, obligations in, in UK GDPR if you're transferring any data. Um, there, there are standard contractual clauses in the UK addendum reference, but you need to think about your transfer risk assessment and what data you're, you're transferring. And there's little in the way of contractual assurances around security of data, but there, there is a lot on the security portal around what OpenAI says that it does. And then the final point I think just to flag on that is, is around API and installation. So if, if you're using the API, the way it works is that you actually um, basically do a prompt in plain English to say what you want it to connect into. And ChatGPT then works out how it connects into your own systems. That sounds really user friendly, but certainly if you speak to security professionals, th there is a concern around how that works and vulnerabilities because you don't ever see the code for the integration of that a API. So again, something to be thinking about from a security perspective um, if you're deciding to use the, the API. The ICOs issued some guidance, you may have seen this, um, it is all fairly common sense. Um, it's the kind of stuff you'd expect to come out with, um, but it, it's, it's a useful reminder if you're thinking of using uh, ChatGPT or GPT-4 or another generative AI service um, in relation to personal data. So think about what your legal basis is for, for what you're doing, um, work out what that is, know whether you're acting as a controller, processor, or a joint controller. I mentioned you know, the default position in, in the DPA on that. Um, Carry out a data protection impact assessment. I mean, this, this is the most important thing you can do because a thorough risk assessment and uh, of what you propose to do, the use case that you have in mind is, is really important um, to actually identify the risks and the mitigations and whether what you do uh, is, is something you want to go ahead with. Um, you need to think about your obligations around transparency and security. So think about your privacy notice, think about what you tell people, and um, think about how you keep data secure. And if you're using this for automated decision making, then again, you've got to think about your Article 22 obligations um, on that as well in terms of the rights individuals have. So I say all of this is fairly common sense, but it's just a good reminder of the steps that you, you want to go through. And just to touch on before I finish on my section, just a bit about EU and UK regulation of AI generally. So you, you will have seen that the UK government has published a white paper, it's consulting in that, and the UK proposed approach is very light touch regulation. So there are five principles that they, they want to build around, but the, the expectation is not to have extensive regulation in terms of, of how AI is used or, or, or indeed provided by, by operators. The ICO has a role in all of this. They, they would be issuing um, guidance in relation to data protection, and they would work alongside other regulators that have an interest, such as you know the CMA and, and others in terms of that guidance. Um, it's interesting that you know, the, the ICO's initial response to this, they, for example, raise questions around how these principles interact with the Article 22 obligations in relation to automated decision making. Um, they raise some questions around controller process identity and, and things like that as well. So the, see that consultation is open. Um, the ICO has published its response and we'll, we'll expect to see um, a final version of the government's proposal um, in, in due course. Within the EU, it's quite different. Um, there's a proposal for an EU AI Act, um, which is going through the, the EU legislative process at the moment. I think there were votes in the European Parliament uh, yesterday and, and this morning on that. And that will impose new obligations on, on both the providers of AI, so people like OpenAI, but also the users as well. Um, and there, there would be specific obligations on users of, of what are called high-risk systems, and that's quite broadly drafted, to carry out risk assessments and certain things that would be not permitted. And generally, the approach like aligns with GDPR. I say that's going through the legislative process at the moment. Um, th there's been a lot of talk within the European Parliament around making changes to the, the AI Act following chat GPT. So that I say we need to see where that goes in terms of the, the trilogue process that will that will, will commence in due course. OK, so just to finish off on, on my sections, if, if, if you have um, within your organization people asking you about using 
generative AI, and I, I know that lots of you will have had this. We've had you know lots of conversations with clients over this over recent months. What, what do you need to be thinking about? Well, yeah, there's a few points to go through. I say one of the key things from a technology perspective is just understanding the difference in terms of using the web interface versus the API version um, of, of ChatGPT, particularly if you are have a use case which might involve personal data. Um, think about whether you can achieve the same outcome or the use case using anonymized or pseudonymized data um, to, to reduce the risk or take it outside the scope of, of data protection law. Um, carry out data protection impact assessment. So that, that is absolutely key for each use case you look at. Indeed, what we're saying to clients is actually you want not just a DPIA, but a, a general risk assessment of, of your use case, considering all, all the other issues that you need to, to work through. Um, and then think about you know internal use cases. So um, yeah, the, 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 your approach to risk might be different if you're using it for internal content generation within your organization versus something that you are allowing uh, your customers um, to use as part of a service that you provide. So if you go into the chat GPT, so the, the GPT-4 website, you'll see OpenAI's various use cases for people like Kayak and others who are embedding the technology to allow their customers to, to use it directly. Um, that's the bit where I think the whole controller process thing becomes quite blurred. And you need to think about that. So assess your risks. Um, you've got to work out are you a controller, are you a processor, or a joint controller, and how you manage your transparency obligations when it's difficult to know actually what, what the technology is doing. How do you manage that? Well, internal approval processes, I think, are really key in this, but also guidance for your staff on, on using generative AI, you know, um, and make sure that's pragmatic guidance. So banning people from using it absolutely is probably doomed to failure. So think about when and what use cases you think actually might be okay or how you help your staff understand how they can use it and um, where, where they should go and who they should speak to if they have an idea where they think that um, it can actually help them to, to do their job better or for, for your organization to be more efficient or launch new services. And then as part of that, you know, I, again, what we're, we're working with clients on is, is actually putting all this into a playbook. So looking at the legal risk, looking at the risk assessment process, checklists and things like that, covering data protection issues, but also issues around IP, liability and security as well. And if, if that's something of interest, please do get in touch and we'd be delighted to speak to you um, further about that. OK, that's my my section done on, on AI, handing over to Rachel, who's going to talk about um, online services, children and uh, the recent TikTok fine. Thanks, Martin. Yes, so I'm going to be talking about the recent TikTok fines. So since our last update in December, this is the one um, more GDPR fine that has been levied by the ICO. And um, there's been various pecker um, fines, but this is this is the one UK GDPR fine. So what happened um, on the fourth of April, 2023, the ICO issued a fine to TikTok of 12.7 million pounds. Um, this is slightly lower um, than its original intensive fine at 27 million um, but I think you'll still agree it's, um, it's still quite a substantial amount. So what did TikTok do wrong? Well there were a couple of main issues that the ICO found with TikTok's practices. Um, firstly um, they found that over 1 million children under 13 um, were on the platform so they were processing their personal data without the consent or authorization of their parents um, or carers. They couldn't evidence that they had any consent um, on, on either from the child directly um, or on their, their parents' behalf, from their parents. Um, they also failed to carry out adequate checks to identify and remove underage children from its platform. Um, internal documents and evidence show that TikTok knew exactly who was on their platform um, and they, they, they knew that this was an issue, um, but no, no measures were taken to ensure that they had the correct lawful basis um, to process that information. Um, and the other main infraction found was that their privacy information um, wasn't compliant with articles um, 13 and 14 of the GDPR. Um, interestingly, um, and you'll, you'll be aware of this if you do um, carry out any processing of children, it's not important just about what's in the, the content of a privacy notice, but also how you display that privacy notice and how that information is communicated. And in the case here of processing of personal data relating to children, the ICO find that the, the privacy information just was not suitable for its audience. 
Um, now, interestingly, I've included a quote here from John Edwards, the current UK Information Commissioner, um, which reads, TikTok should have known better and TikTok should have done better. Um, and although the, the, the ultimate fine was lower than the 27 million in the original intent to fine, um, he still says that this reflects the serious impact that their failures have had. Um, they did not do enough to check who was using the platform or take sufficient action to remove the underage children that were using the platform. So what can we learn from this? Um, so since the, the investigation started into TikTok by the ICO, the, the children's code has been published. Um, so if you do do any processing relating to, to children or young people, um, I would recommend that, that you go and have a look at that. And question whether this is the end of the road for TikTok um, in terms of its other um, actions. Um, so that the UK is not alone in taking action against TikTok. Um, there's currently a class action in, in Portugal, um, and you'll probably be aware of other action that's been taken around the world, including in the US, um, Australia, and New Zealand as well. Um, and although they're, they're, in, they're in the public eye, um, what, they're, what the, the ICO is expecting of, of TikTok in terms of its transparency and in its checks um, can really be applied to, to any organisation that processes personal data relating to children. Um, it's a particular focus of the ICO because it sees it just naturally as particularly intrusive over other types of processing. Um, so if you do process any personal data relating to children, um, there are some interesting learnings from this and um, I'd, yeah, I'd again direct you to the, the age appropriate design codes for, for more information on that. Thank you, Rachel. So I wanted to come back and talk a little bit about international transfers. So there have been a number of developments starting with the US. And I think to be to be fair, this has been a large um, issue for some time. And I think since the Schrems decision in 2020, um, we there has been no established transfer mechanism for data going from the EU to the US. Um, what we have had, though, is a lot of political discussions ongoing between the EU and the US. And in March 22, the EU and US presidents announced an agreement in principle had been reached for a new data privacy framework. And that would provide a new set of rules and binding safeguards to limit access to data by US intelligence. And that was that's clearly been one of the, the main concerns that the EU has had for a long time in terms of mass surveillance by US intelligence agencies. Uh, backing that up would be a new two-tier redress system, including a data protection review court, uh, strong obligations for companies processing EU data. So um, this data privacy framework would operate in a similar way to both Safe Harbor and uh, Privacy Shield in the sense that it's only for companies that actually voluntarily agree to be bound by it and to, to adhere to it and be subject to sanction if they don't. And there would be specific monitoring and review mechanisms. So um, the aim of the deal is not only to provide adequate data protection, but actually to boost the competitive digital economy. I think the EU. Um, commission and US government recognise that the current situation post REMS 2 is wholly unsatisfactory and relying on things like EU SECs is, is not really going to be satisfactory going forward. Uh, in pursuance of that deal, uh, President Biden signed an executive order on enhancing safeguards for US intelligence activities. Uh, and accompanying regulations reaffirming these policies. Uh, and the US agencies have to review their policies and procedures to ensure that they implement those safeguards. It looked like plain sailing, although the EDPB then uh, issued an opinion on the basis of what they'd seen. And whilst they were cautiously welcoming the proposed deal, they have suggested a number of improvements. My understanding that's now back in the US court, and I, and I don't mean the US court as in a, a legal court, back in the, in, the, in the realms of the US government to look at those uh, improvements and see whether or not they can, they do them. My understanding is that on the US side, they're quite optimistic they can do some, some of these things, but they were mainly about actually understanding what would happen below the deal in a transparent way to, 
to give comfort to the Europeans that actually the things that were being signed in by that executive order were actually happening on the ground. So the intention uh, has been that the framework will be signed this year. Originally, I think it was quarter one, quarter two this year. I think we're now back into quarter three. But if this deal can be made um, to happen, then I think it will be welcomed by all sides because the current situation, for, which has been going since Schrems two, has been unsatis unsatisfactory. And of course, we we must also remember that I think Max Schrems has already said he's not he's not particularly impressed by the new deal. So I would expect that there may yet yet be a challenge to the new privacy framework, but we may at least get a year or two before that challenge gets up to probably the European Court again. On the UK side, um, so um, again, as with the EU, there's been no valid data transfer mechanism between the UK and US since the SREMS 2 decision, other than through um, EU SECs, the UK. Um, but in terms of a, a mechanism, you know, the same concerns between the UK and the US. So, but dialogue has been ongoing, and the UK and US governments launched a com comprehensive dialogue in technology and data, which built on a previous commitment to develop a technology partnership and move towards data adequacy. Uh, one of the key aims of that is to ensure that there can be free um, bilateral exchanges of data for um, for participating companies. And this again is to support the data innovation. And I mentioned earlier. Um, UK government's desire to be seen to be a more global uh, economic uh, player. So um, the Biden executive order that I mentioned previously has been welcomed by the UK and the UK intends to assess this with the aim of issuing its own adequacy decision and it will still be an adequacy decision because the number two bill won't be in law by then uh, working towards and effectively then the US would extend that executive order uh, to include the UK. And then that, the intent there is that that will restore a valid and, valid and reliable data transfer mechanism. And it'd be interesting to see whether or not, you know, if Max Schrems is aiming to invalidate that potentially at an EU level, whether or not that there would be a challenge in the UK. My sense is that it will be more difficult to challenge in a UK basis because of the way that um, UK GDPR is being uh, amended uh, or likely to be amended under the new legislation, but we'll see. Um, I just wanted to to pick up. I think we tend to to be very yeah, EU and UK focused in our in our outlook on uh, data privacy. I think for me, what's and and I think this may become a more regular slot on these regular updates that we do, is looking more widely at what's happening across the globe in terms of data privacy. Um, so I, this could almost be a quiz, but I'm not going to do that. Um, there are various so various country symbols up there. In terms of countries that either have got data privacy legislation or are considering it, and I think one of the things that strike, strikes me looking at that and is looking at the left-hand side of the screen uh, and the US. So we see California, California um, blazed the trail uh, with the CCPA a couple of years back. But actually, there are there is a move across the, uh, across the United States with various state laws coming in. Um, so in terms of uh, states that have passed privacy laws, they're not all necessarily enforced, but are passed. It's not just California, you have Virginia, you've got Colorado, you've got Connecticut. And then there are other states that are in the process of looking at adopting privacy laws. You know, Indiana, Iowa, Utah, uh, New York, I think, has been looking at it, New York State as well. So actually what we're seeing is that the ripple effect from what was initially just GDPR is extending wider. And, you know, beyond that, we have India looking at data privacy legislation, uh, UAE adopting it, China has its own data protection legislation, uh, Brazil, UAE, Vietnam, uh, there are others. Um, but what I think this is doing, if we can maybe move on to the next slide, is I think what this is doing is it's changing the data protection landscape and how we should view this. Because I think previously, um, we've always viewed this from a GDPR perspective and viewed this through the prism of uh, data
data leaving the EU or the UK and whether we can justify that for a particular purpose. But actually what we're seeing as we get increasing number of countries and states within countries adopting or considering uh, data privacy laws is that actually it's no longer just a one-way issue in terms of data transfers that are data transfers back and whether those data transfers to the UK or the EU can be justified from the country from which that data is coming. So for example, China, whatever it is. So actually, um, Data, data privacy and data, global data flows, I think, are going to become more challenging because the laws um, that are being passed are, are they, some of them are very similar. Some of them are modeled on GDPR. Some of them have data security components that are drawn from other uh, legal systems, including China. So actually, looking at uh, data flows going in two directions involves not just a consideration of whether the UK or EU data protection law will allow it, but whether or not data flows into the UK or EU or indeed any other country uh, would be permissible under the laws where the data is. So, and the motivations for these data protection laws are not always the same. So some of them are purely economic reasons. Uh, some of them are very much designed to be consumer protection. And some of them are actually, you know, motivated by national security and, and data sovereignty. So actually what we're seeing is that the landscape as it becomes, as we look at more globally, um, is becoming more populated by different data privacy laws. And therefore the issues in terms of data transfers are no longer just simply UK GDPR, EU GDPR and the US and, you know, adequacy decisions. There are lots of different laws and there will be lots of different moving parts. So for those organizations that operate globally or transfer data gl globally, keeping an eye on how these laws evolve will be increasingly important. So I will hand back for a quick case digest. Thanks, sure. Grant. So I'm just going to quickly run through some other um, ICO um, and European court action um, over the last few months. So as Grant mentioned in his section on the ICO 25 plan and the new policy direction of the ICO, um, there has been a greater use of re reprimands by the ICO. Um, until 2020, um, they, they seem to be rarely used, averaging around eight per year. However, that slowly grew to 24 in 2021 and then 28 in 2022. Um, and you might have noticed that since December just passed, um, the ICO has actually been making all reprimands public unless there is good reason to do so. Um, so what is a reprimand? A reprimand isn't a fine um, and it doesn't compel an organisation to do anything. Um, however, um, it generally takes the form of a written letter stating that the ICO believes that your, that your organisation has not complied with the UK GDPR and then it is accompanied by a list of reasons for that decision um, and a list of recommended actions that the organisation should take. So as I say, um, it's, it's not a formal um, form of enforcement action and it's not going to compel you to do anything um, and it's also not, not a fine. However, I think it's interesting that they're now being made public um, and the implications and the consequences that can flow from from that. So, um, you know, obviously there's then potentially reputational issues. Um, and also I think as well, if you're then on the ICO's radar, um, you know, it, 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 it probably means that going forward, if anything else was to come to their attention um, and you hadn't implemented some of the recommended actions, um, it might not be um, so so favourable later down the line. Um, so some recent um, reprimands, just to quickly go through them, um, essentially in Achieving for Children, um, this was a case of um, a social worker um, disclosing a, a, a child risk assessment to, to the wrong party. And this contained a number of special category and criminal convictions data. So the types of um, actions, recommended mitigations um, to take forward, the ICO recommended were things like it recommended that every employee um, who is expected to complete redactions in such circumstances should um, complete redaction training. 
Senior leadership um, should um, have their roles and responsibilities documented in policies um, and guidance and making sure that that policy and guidance is communicated throughout the organisation and also an expectation and a recommendation that all staff members continue to have data protection training. On the Gain Capital UK reprimand, so this was a case of uh, um, an unauthorised third party leveraging um, as a site vulnerability. So personal data of around 70,000 UK data subjects were affected by the incident. So what the ICO found was that the, the, the company didn't have a patch management programme in place. Um, and so it recommended that it did implement a programme to ensure um, its approach to patch management was, was better going forward. And in the Department for Education, this was a case of a third party having access to records of, of learners in England and Wales. Um, generally in order to um, educational qualifications and to check if they are um, eligible for funding for future courses. Um, and it turned out that one of the one of the third parties was no longer one of the, the funding providers and it still had access to this database. And then it was then using information in that database to cross reference um, ages of gambling companies, um, their like new accounts that were being made to ensure that people creating gambling accounts were over the age of 18. So clearly not in line with the original purpose. Um, and that was the, the nature of the ICO's reprimand. Now, in the interest of time, I'll just quickly run through the, the European cases. Um, so obviously they don't have binding effect within the UK, but they can still be persuasive. Um, so firstly, concept of copy in a data subject access request. Essentially, although you're entitled to information in a subject access request, that information has to be intelligible and has to make sense. So if that means providing a copy of the information, then, then, then you need to do that. And I'll just quickly cover the last one, I think, just in the interest of time. So this was an interesting case where the German procurement court was asked whether um, a, a German subsidiary in Germany who had a US parent could be deemed to be undertaking an international transfer because of the existence of that US parent, even if there was no direct access or data sharing to that US parent. So this was, um, it's not quite made its way fully through the German courts yet, but what's quite interesting so far is that it has been struck out at the moment on the basis that mere possibility of access by a US parent wouldn't um, constitute an international transfer. Rather, there would actually have to be an active transfer there. Um, so if, if any of you are in situations where you're, you're multinational and you have parent companies or just group companies in different jurisdictions, um, that, that's an interesting one to, to keep an eye on. I think we can move on to the, the Q&A now. Thanks, Rachel. Um, yeah, so just conscious time, but a couple of questions um, we've had come in. I'll try and just group some of them together. I think there's one probably for you, Grant, um, which is, I, I suppose, two things. One around... Um, what we think the impact will be in terms of the change to the accountability matrix um, in under UK law and whether people will actually do anything with that um, if you've already got a compliance framework in place. But then more generally, do we think that that has likely to have an impact on the EU adequacy decision? What about the ICO's plan that you was doing stuff differently to the, the EU DPAs? Does that have a, do we think that might have an impact on adequacy? Okay, let me try and, let me try and um, answer that. I think the UK government has been mindful throughout that it doesn't want to jeopardise the adequacy finding that um, the EU made. I think the quote from Michelle Donnellan was, was pretty clear on that too. So one would expect that the UK government is at least consulting with, I would imagine, the European Commission in terms of its its proposals. I think a lot of these changes, you know, a lot of the changes in the bill are intended uh, to clarify and to simplify I'm less concerned that things like record keeping is is likely to be viewed as a as a big issue for the EU. I think what the, the EU will be looking at very very closely is the UK's plans for recognising countries for international transfers. The UK's, you know, is is quite ambitious in terms of the countries that it would like to consider for an adequacy decision, and there's quite there's quite a number, and they they I think. 
tend to be economically driven as much as anything else. So I think one of the concerns that the EU may have is that the UK opens a back door for its data if it's transferred to the UK to then be transferred someplace else on the back of a, an adequacy decision. So I think that sort of thing is likely to be something that will be high up on the EU's uh, watch list. Um, in terms of, you know, what is the benefit of, of these changes? I think, well, if you are already complying with an EU program, if you're regulated by EU GDPR anyway, then you may look at a lot of this stuff and think, well, actually it doesn't, it's not, it's not really worth uh, going down the route of simplifying uh, to, simplifying or taking the benefit of the simplifications in the UK regime. We're already complying with the EU. We will continue, we will continue to do that. Um, I think though for domestic, so for domestic companies, domestic businesses that don't have any national uh, compliance issues and are pretty much hosting their data locally, you know, some of these uh, simplifications will be welcomed. It will be less of a compliance burden. And I suppose for larger organizations, if there is the possibility of perhaps, you know, creating a UK operation that doesn't actually touch on EU data at all. So there's ring fenced, it's not, it's not touching their EU operations or EU data, then possibly there might be opportunities, you know, the, the simplification, the potential. Uh, increased um, adequacy decisions from the UK regime may may offer business opportunities. So I think it I think it's a I think it's a bit of a I think it is a bit of, bit of a mixed bag. And uh, you know, depending on your circumstances, this may actually be welcomed or actually not make much difference. Uh, the ICO's attitude, I think, and I think um, is subtly changing. I think the ICO will tell you they don't think they are going softer. They're actually, they think they're actually publicly reprimanding, actually may be a way, a better way to drive behavior than, than just simply fining. So I know that John Edwards is less of a believer in just reaching to fine folk. I think the IECO's view is that uh, the money go round that was fining the public sector. So taking money away from the public sector at the moment is just actually uh, harming frontline services and probably making it more difficult for the public sector to actually comply with the rules that they've already broken. And therefore, he doesn't see the point in that. Um, is that unfair on private sector organizations who will get fined? Um, well, I think I think there is there's definitely that argument. It'll be interesting to see how this kind of policy evolves. Um, I think the ICO, again, is keen not to be seen as a soft touch, but there is no doubt that there is, you know, there is a different, there is a different wind blowing in the UK, and the ICO is trying to, is trying to 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 go with that. Thanks, Grant. And I think just picking up on one one other question that came in on on that point, um, it it's while while I think a lot of the reprimands have been to public sector organisations, they are not exclusively for that. So there have been private sector organisations who've received a reprimand. Um, it's, it's not just a thing for the public sector. So yeah, I think we need to just watch, wait and see how that um, that develops. Um, and you know, even with a reprimand, um, it's it's still not not a good thing in terms of the, the damage to reputation and the your name appearing up there in the, on the ICO website. Okay, but um, well that's us at uh, just gone 10 too. So um, we're a little bit over time. Sorry for keeping you a bit longer um, than we had said we would. Um, thank you very much for attending again. We will run this webinar again um, in the autumn. Dates will come out for that uh, after the summer. Um, in the meantime, thank you very much for joining. Uh, do get in touch if you've got any questions. And uh, Okay, thanks again. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.